What's happening? Thanks for joining us on this Friday. It's Big Ten Today, fueled by Gatorade. I'm Anthony Harum. I got Jake Butt here alongside. We're going to do that spring football. We're going to do that NFL draft. We're going to do that hockey all throughout the show today. And, and Jake, you're, you're doing quite a few things on your calendar here. As of late, it's the month of April. You're spinning some plates. You got some personal stuff coming up in the days to come as well, man. Do you feel like you're kind of keeping track of everything? Absolutely. Uh, getting married. So love, yes. love is in the air, yes. Anthony. And you know what? You know what? I, you got, is it, did you guys make this layout for me? That open, We're talking Michigan hockey. We're talking right. Jalen Harrell. Like, right. this is great, man. This is I awesome. Mean, just a little precursor, man. We yeah. want this month to go very smoothly for you, as I'm sure we all out <laughs> there do well let's go ahead and transition into the big story and uh, when it comes down to it because we've got spring football action on the network this weekend and all throughout the conference we figured it's a great opportunity to talk about the Buckeyes the Nittany Lions the Boilermakers as they get set to take the field this weekend in spring football action and because they will be doing so you see it on Fox Sports you see a couple of the games on the Big Ten Network as well and this time of year is always an interesting one because of the fact that spring football is here and at noon we'll see the Boilermakers in action at Ross A, then at two the Nittany Lions take the field for the blue and white game. It's all Saturday on the Big Ten Network and the Fox Sports app. And with that in mind, let's start off and just kind of preview where all three of these individual teams are at right now at this point in the spring. Now, Purdue is interesting because they're, they're actually going to continue practicing, but most of the teams who take the field will be sort of closing their spring endeavors this Saturday. Let's start in Columbus with Ohio State. Ryan Day, of course, said that there's pressure every season when mm -hmm. you're the head coach of the Buckeyes. Ryan Day, no stranger to that. But, you know, having Chip Kelly as, as an offensive coordinator, that to me is an intriguing part of the storyline as they transition a bit on offense. So what impact do you think Chip Kelly's presence can end up making? Well, I mean, you got one of the great offensive minds in college football now calling plays for you. Uh, just a phenomenal coach in general. Uh, as far as impact goes, though, I, I want to make this point because I don't think it, you know, it wasn't a skill, it wasn't a talent issue. Right. It wasn't a, I think they had great scheme. Um, that wasn't the reason they weren't achieving their goals. It's yeah. a little bit here, a little bit there. We'll talk about it. But what, what I'm excited to see is what new wrinkles. This is not going to be a brand new offense. It's still going to be that Buckeye offense you're used to seeing. But what new wrinkles? And to transition then, who's going to be the quarterback? Yeah. Okay, we'll talk coordinators and we'll talk quarterback. If it's Will Howard under center, the veteran, they brought him into the transfer portal, he can run now. He can run. So do they have more quarterback runs in their base play package than they did when Kyle McCord was under center? But I'll tell you who I'm really excited to see. I know the, the buzz in Columbus is about Julian saying the freshman. I mean, they, he got his black stripe removed. Yeah. Ryan Day is talking about him. So I'm excited to see those two guys compete. And you just go down the offense, Anthony. Jeremiah Smith. I mean, you, you've seen the tapes. Uh -huh. you've seen the, uh -huh. they, they, that is a talented Buckeye receiver room, and they talk about him like he's already the top guy on their roster. He <laughs> is a stud. I can't wait to see him. And, and truly, is this the best running back room in the country, not just the conference? Isn't Javion Henderson and, and uh, Quinshawn Judkins. Um, I, I'm all excited to see that. But we had a graphic there at talking about the defensive side of the football. Mm -hmm. Of course, the quarterbacks will dominate the headline. But to me, I can't wait to see year three of Jim Knowles. That's a, I've been saying this. It's a very complex, aggressive, downhill system. So in year one, you're learning terminology. You can't go too deep. Well, they took a big jump last year, uh, one of the best scoring defenses, total defenses in the country. Now year three, this is your language. Mm. Now you can start to understand why coach is calling something in certain situations. You know what your responsibility is as well as the others around you, which allows you to play fast. And they return a bunch of guys on defense, but in, in Jim Knowles' defense, safety is a key position. I can't wait to see Caleb Downs because yeah. he might be the best safety in college football. So there's a lot of positive momentum going for Ohio State. Uh, just excited to see some of these new pieces. And with, with those new pieces, you mentioned Caleb Downs. You also get some returners up front from a really deep and talented defensive line as well. And so in Columbus, I think we had a couple of years in a row where the thought was, well, how can the Ohio State defense sort of get up to a championship caliber that it felt like the offense was really achieving at? Now it's almost like the conversation yeah. is, is flipped a little bit. We're wondering, can the offense sort of step back forward here? I, I, I do want to get your, your additional thought on the defense, though, because of some of that continuity you referenced with Jim Knowles in the third season. 
Can this potentially be, potentially, the best defense in America when you factor in some of the things you referenced, the infusion of additional talent on the back end also? If you're saying potentially, yeah. absolutely. Like, if we're going to have a conversation and just close our eyes say, who could potentially be the best deep? Ohio State is in that conversation, absolutely. And if I was those guys in the locker room, and if I'm Jim Knowles, and if I'm Ryan Day, I'd repeat that to myself every day. They, they have earned the right to believe that, absolutely. They returned a bunch of key pieces back on defense. JT Tuomolo, uh, Denzel Burke, you went yeah. to the transfer portal and added talent. And again, there's a progression that happens with complex defenses. It's the same thing when Jim Knowles was at Oklahoma State. Look at his defensive rankings year over year. They improved every year, and to me that's a signal of guys starting to understand the complexity of this defense. You'd expect it to be even better in Ohio State. And you, you referenced something to me earlier in the week that I really think is an underappreciated point if we flip to the offense about Chip Kelly and the impact that he can have not only on the offense as a whole, but the talent they have in the backfield is one thing, adding Jutkins in with a talented backfield, but just the run game for Ohio State. And if it's Will Howard or one of the young guys ends up getting in their QB, having a great run game can take pressure off of how you're going to operate trying to pass the football, regardless of how talented they are at wide receiver. Do you anticipate to continue to see an Ohio State run game that steps forward? I, if I was the Buckeyes, that's what I would be hoping to see. Uh, you know, you're going to be judged off that Michigan game, right? Like, that, that's been their Achilles heel. And Michigan has won the trench battle these past three years. That's been the big difference. Uh, so you have two of the best running backs Either individual could be considered one of the best in the country. You add them together, and that's the best running back room in the country. If Will Howard starts, I mean, I played against JT Barrett. You don't know how many times it's third and five, and you're sitting there with a great defense, and no one's open, and then JT Barrett would get you six yards and move the chains. A mobile quarterback can rip your heart out. That, that could be Will Howard with those backs. And I think when we think of Chip Kelly, we, we think of, explosive offenses, and naturally you almost just go straight to the passing game. But he's put together some really productive rushing attacks as well throughout his entire career. So I would expect to see new wrinkles. I think they can – it took them a while to find their uh, rushing identity last year. Yeah. I, I would expect them to have an identity going into year one. And to put a, put a bow on this, we, we talk about the skill positions and the headlines – the, the offensive line, I think, will once again dictate the ceiling of this team. If they can be dominant, that's going to benefit them. If they, are how, if they were how they started the season last year, I think that will limit their chance to, to feel confident about going to win a national championship. Another team with national championship expectations resides in State College. And for Penn State, there's going to be three new coordinators that they'll have out there. It'll be Andy Kotelnicki on offense. Tom Allen brings his LEO mentality to that Penn State defense. And I want to go to, to James Franklin and how having new coordinators in every slot running things, how much additional influence does James Franklin need to have just on the whole picture? Because there's continuity up front. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he's at the top of things. He's been a head coach there for a decade now. But when you have new coordinators, new voices, perhaps new schemes implemented, then how much does James Franklin need to make sure that those players feel that things are still moving in a fluid manner? Mm -hmm. Well, I, he's the architect. And particularly this time of year in spring ball, and it's going to apply in fall camp. Like, it's your offensive scheme versus your defensive scheme. And Manny Diaz ran an exotic defense. When you played Penn State when he was their defensive coordinator, you were going to see that type of defense once a year, hmm. right? So your Penn State's offense had been going against an exotic outlier in terms of defensive scheme all offseason. And I do think there's something to be said that that can limit your exposure to defenses you're going to see more commonly throughout the yeah. year. Where Tom Allen, it's going to be a new, new scheme on both sides of the ball. Tom Allen, though he likes to be aggressive, has a different – defensive philosophy in terms of scheme than Manny Diaz. So for James Franklin, the value now with all these new pieces is structuring practice in a way where it can be competitive for both sides of the ball. So it's you never want one side to be too dominant. You want a little back and forth. You want, you want some competition going. And then all of a sudden the locker room is going to be saying, guys, we have a team. We can go get this done. So the quarterback position in Drew Aller, there were big expectations going into last season. I almost wonder if the expectations statistically will be a bit more tempered this year. They do add Julian Fleming, who was the number one receiver in the country as a recruit, didn't completely break through in Columbus. So they get him into State College. 
let, let me pose the question to you this way and kind of put you on the spot a little bit. The Penn State run game that was very explosive a couple of seasons ago, led by Nick Singleton and Kay Tron Allen, does that take a bigger step back to the explosion we saw? Or will the Penn State passing attack be more important for that to become more explosive with Allen? You're not going to like my answer. Right. I'm going to say it, it's going to, they're all dependent on one another. Okay. Um, and you know, the offensive line at times last year, though I thought they were improved, it still left something to be desired. So the run game, of course, it's reliant on the offensive line. But the run game's also reliant on the ability to throw the ball down the field. Mm -hmm. Because if teams don't believe you can stre uh, you know, stress them vertically, if teams don't respect your ability to attack their corners and their secondary one-on-one, -on -one, you can load the box, which then limits your ability to, to run the football. You look at Kyle Nicky in, in his history, Kansas, let's not forget where Kansas was 10 years ago, right? They, they were not, definitely not known as a quality college football program. Mm. And then under his leadership, the offense was phenomenal. The, the quarterbacks were developed. So what I'm really excited to see is, can he unlock the full potential of Drew Aller? Mm. He did some great things on tape. You can yeah. see what can make him special. Can he unlock that? And then who's going to be the alpha dog in that wide receiver room? You know, Lambert Smith, there was half the time he was that guy and half the time he wasn't able to uh, overcome that. You mentioned Julian Fleming. That's a crowded Buckeye wide receiver room. So what does he do now when he's actually starting this offseason in that conversation to be the top dog? Uh, th that to me is, again, it's the offense as a whole last year was not good enough, particularly in big games, but having the right coordinator can unlock the potential that I believe Penn State has on their roster. Really curious before we transition to Purdue, Abdul Carter moves. He transitions from Penn State, being an off-ball linebacker. Now he's going to be a defensive end. Mm -hmm. A player of that talent, that ability, is that – is it a risky move for a guy who was already productive at one spot? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because we'll talk about Purdue where they got, they got Kydron Jenkins, their outside right. line, and they moved him back inside, and they say that's you're off the ball, you can make more plays. Yeah. You know, we're, you're an edge rusher. If there's a great edge rusher, I mean, we played against Joey Bosa back at Michigan. We're running away from him. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? We're gonna, right. You're going to get away from him. And yet at the same time, when, when you do have a guy like Abdul Carter, a, a great edge rusher can wreck a game. If you can beat a tackle consistently and that quarterback doesn't feel comfortable in the pocket, part of the reason Michigan ran the ball 30 times to end the game last year is because no one could block Chop Robinson or Adisa Isaac coming yeah. off the edge. So there is risk, but I, the defense has proven that we should trust what they got going on out there in Penn State. So I'm excited to see the move, excited to see what he does. I'm very excited to see Ryan Walters in year two in West Life. And for, for him as, as a coach now, he's infused a lot of talent. This is a top 10 transfer portal class that he mm -hmm. brings in as well. So for him in his second season, having more competitive depth in this spring, he's talked about it. I spoke to him earlier this week about it being a more physical spring mm -hmm. than they had in the past. How big of a difference can that make? Not just that the roster overall is deeper. Yeah, night, night and day. Uh, they had 60 guys on their roster last year at this time. 60. Now they got they got nearly double that. I mean, that it, it's already hard year one because you're learning the names of the your teammates and your coaches. You're learning the names of the scheme. You just don't have a chance to build that chemistry and go too deep. And then you go from 60 guys to 80 guys. You're trying to build your roster all the way through summer and through camp. It's just a lot of change. Well, now you have an established roster, and he, he shared the same sentiment. Uh, offensive line, Graham Harrell was telling us towards the end of the season, like they didn't have six healthy guys that could play a full Big Ten football game. Mm. Now they're three deep. Okay. They brought in a bunch of new guys in the portal. Their average size of new offensive linemen is six foot four, three fifteen. Hmm. So they're deeper, but they're bigger, but they're stronger. Hudson Card added twenty pounds. You know, we we heard the buzz about him last year and his potential. What does he do? A bunch of new wide receivers in the transfer portal. Excited to see that. And then on the defensive side of the ball, that's Ryan Walter's specialty. They were good, and then there'd be a handful of plays last year that just killed them. Yeah. Well, they have raved about the pieces they've got, particularly in the secondary. I'm just saying we got to keep our eye on Nylon Green because without hesitation, you know, coaches like to like to slow play it a little right, bit. Maybe right. they don't, they don't want to set too high of expectations. That's not the case with Nylon Green. They think he can be one of the best corners in this conference, and that's Ryan Walter's specialty as well. I can't wait to see it. And at receiver, you know, they lost a number of the guys who made plays for them last season. There is an infusion of new talent that lines up there on the outside also. And you referenced Graham Harrell. 
we know what his version of the air raid can be. Is, is it a type of system that you see receivers being able to transition into quickly, especially when experience returns at QB? It's a great question. This air raid system is different. My, my time at Michigan, you know, being a pro style, if the, if the sheet said 15 yards and come back to the quarterback, you had to be there 15. Whereas that's still true in the air raid system. But part of it, there's a little bit of fluidity where the, the quarterbacks and the receivers have freedom to change things on the fly. So what's really key there is having a relationship in chemistry. So yes, they have a bunch of new pieces, but another thing that they both Ryan Walters and Graham Harrell mentioned was Hudson Card's leadership and communication. They said last spring, he was a little bit hesitant to say, this is my team. This spring, he's stopping practice. He's going over to the receivers and saying, I need you here right now. Mm -hmm. He's changing protections. He's talking to the tight ends. So I, I think to answer your question in a long-winded way, yeah. uh, it's dependent on Hudson Hudson Card as a quarterback to be the leader of these guys. A lot of work in progress can get done, not just in spring ball, but in May, June, July. You want to come into camp with that chemistry already in place, and now you're going to work it against a defense. I do want to say, uh, make a bold prediction here. Okay? okay. I'm all ears, man. What's up? Keep your eye on Max Clare, their tight end. Right. I saw him in camp last year, and I said, who, who is that guy? He was mm. a freshman at the time. And Again, the whispers around the program, he might end up being their best weapon. Purdue has developed, a, a, I've actually done a great job producing quality tight ends. Yeah. I would not be surprised if at the end of the season we saw Max Clare with Big Ten honors. Oh, okay. Bold prediction I'm putting the here pressure on April, you, Max. man. I'm putting the pressure Getting on you. Getting bold predictions you already it. from Jake Butt right here. We love it, especially at the tight end position. I mean, who knows tight ends? Had to ends. do it, right? Better than Jake Butt. A lot of moments in that game where Michigan was still in the mix, but on the whole this season, third consecutive Frozen Four appearance responsible for the top six point scorers in the Big Ten, five of which were sophomores. So the potential for a lot of the roster to return intact after losing a bunch of talent to the National Hockey League last season. We saw Dylan Duke led the Big Ten with 26 goals on the season and had the Big Ten Player of the Year, Gavin Brindley, as well. Let's go back out to St. Paul, where Rick and Cappy were there to put a bow on things. Anthony, thanks. The Big Ten season, Michigan season, coming to a close on Thursday night with a 4 nothing loss to Boston College in the national semifinals. Paul Capanigri and I were here to watch it. And, Cappy, it just seemed like every time Michigan offensively tried to get going, Boston College had an answer, whether it was blocking shots yeah. in the slot, whether it was Jacob Fowler turning away shots from the Wolverines who had 32, 10 more than Boston College in this game. Michigan could never really get the offense going that they wanted or the offense that had served them so well through the course of the year. Yeah, and it's funny because I think talking about this game leading up, we thought all offense, right? Even with Boston College, the number one, number one and two offenses in the country, the power plays, everything. But I think this game was won on defense for Boston College and in goal. You said those numbers of shots, the 71 shot attempts to 40 or 73 to 41 Michigan over Boston College. Like the numbers, a lot of the numbers tell you Michigan maybe wins this game or it's, or, it's, on the or it's a 3-2 game, you know, something like that. But Boston College in the end, they, they capitalized on mistakes and then they played really well in front of their net. You, you, we hit on this as we, you know, as the game was going on last night, that it just, they looked like they just frustrated Michigan yeah. and it affected their shot quality. Maybe the attempts they took weren't as good as they taken in the season all season long. And it's because BC, I think, frustrated them and, and kudos to them. I think one thing that frustrated Michigan fans throughout a lot of the year, and it was something Michigan solved late in the season, yeah. untimely penalties and undisciplined play sure. that happened at really critical moments on Thursday night, including Michigan had just gone on a power play. Yep. They take a penalty. They want it to stay five on five, avoid special teams. I know four on four is officially even <laughs> strength, right. but it was that four on four stretch in this game when BC scored twice and basically put the game away. Yeah. And ironically, again, that's somewhere that Michigan salivates usually when they are on four on four. And I just, they, they played a the number one team in the country. They didn't have any weaknesses. Like, they didn't have a fatal flaw you could exploit. And then when you thought a, a Michigan four-on-four four where they would elevate, you know, they stumbled and gave up two within a minute of each other. 
that really just deflated. The second goal going off the skate and in, you know, those types of goals are tough ones because you look up and then you're like, what, we didn't do anything wrong. What that happened? We score, they scored on us. Um, and then they get another one after that. Cutter Gauthier, you know, 38 goals. You can't give that guy breakaways. So the special teams, they couldn't get the power. 35% power play. BC did a great job of cross those cross ice passes, those seam passes that Michigan loves to make. They were blocking those. They were frustrating Michigan, and it, you did not see that all year from Michigan. It's a frozen four for a third straight year, but also a third straight loss in the national semifinals. Yeah. So I think the outsider in the college hockey world says, well, the year was a success for Michigan. Right. How true is that statement? Uh, I mean, if you're asking me, I say, yes, it is. Are, is, is that locker room last night are they feeling like success? Probably not getting shut out. A lot of guys have been 0-3 in the Frozen Four, but they have Big Ten championships. But at Michigan, they're looking for that national title. It's been since 1998. They have nine national titles, tied for the most. We'll see what happens with Denver on Saturday night if they take the lead with that. But they're they're at the point now when they're getting the players, the kind of recruits they have there. They're trying to win national titles. So, yes, you'll say a lot of successful, a lot of happy with a lot of things, progress from players. But in the long run, you get shut out in the Frozen Four. You're not going to feel like it's a complete success. Big Ten season as a whole. Michigan makes the Frozen. You have Michigan State going to the regional final before falling to the Wolverines there after yeah. winning the Big Ten regular season <laughs> right. and tournament title. Wisconsin and Minnesota also make it back to the NCAA tournament. Right. What are the biggest takeaways from the season as a whole inside Big Ten hockey? Yeah, I think the the you saw Michigan State coming. You didn't know how fast it was going to come. And the same with Wisconsin. And I think they both elevated, and they're like – I've talked about in the past, they're putting pressure on the other programs now with, with, with Michigan and Minnesota know that these guys are here and they're here to stay. And they're going to put pressure because it becomes recruiting battles too, right? They're going to go after the same players. And now there's not one or two teams they're battling within just the conference. Now they're talking about four or five teams. So that's going to make it dynamic. And I think it's going to make the league better. Uh, the coaching has never been as good as it is right now from one through seven. And I'm, I'm excited for the future. Obviously, the Big Ten needs to find a way to get that first national championship. But I think how competitive the league is getting, just think about where we started. You know, we were happy to get one team ever in the Frozen Four. Now we've had con three years consecutive, five teams total in the last three years make Frozen Four. Now it's time to finish that off. And I think we have the coaching, and you're going to get the recruits to do it. It's just a matter of time. Oh, the recruits are coming, but also some decisions are coming in the days and weeks to follow this Frozen Four because Michigan is a team loaded with draft picks. We saw Minnesota's Jimmy Snuggeroo decide to come back. Coaches now can really get out into the transfer portal, try to bolster positions that maybe they need a little help in. And we have no idea what happens with these guys. Some we expect to go, actually stay. Some we expect stay to tuned, stay, right? actually I mean, go. We might know by the end of the weekend on a lot of The things. season is over, but the drama is not. It's been a great season doing it with you, my yeah, man. Awesome. As we wrap things up here from St. Paul, Anthony, back to you in Chicago. It's always fun to watch Wolverines highlights, but especially when they're coming off a national championship. This is our big stat fueled by Gatorade and as we prepare for the NFL draft a lot of Michigan men expecting to hear their names called here's what it looks like in the modern draft era just all time over that time frame various programs around the country and how many players they've had drafted Michigan well into the top 10 there on this list 289 players in the modern draft era have been drafted from the University of Michigan. And that brings us to our big interview with the leader in sacks from the Michigan Wolverines and an individual who not only statistically on the field was spectacular, but also all Big Ten in the classroom as well. That is Jalen Harrell. And Jalen, you've been getting ready for the National Football League. You've finished the season. You're doing the All-Star Game circuit. You're doing the combine, all these other things. It can be a bit of a whirlwind, man. How's this whole process? Says treating you. <clears throat> no, it's going good. You know, what I'm saying, uh, you know, our season went long because you know we was a national championship and whatnot. But you know, what I'm saying, uh, it's been great. You know, what I'm saying uh, after the after the season, you know, I went straight straight to training down in Florida. Uh, you know, what I'm saying they got ready for the uh, All Star game, the Senior Bowl. Then after that, I had to get ready for the, the combine and pro day and whatnot. So it's just been a real constant grind and constant. Uh, you know, just continuing to get better every day. 
And the Senior Bowl specifically, I mean, that, that's a game with so much history behind it. It's probably the most renowned postseason all-star game. How exciting was it when you got that invitation? You know, it was real exciting. You know, uh, something I dreamed of, you know, just going out there competing with the best of the best and uh, just showcasing all your abilities in front of the uh, top personnel, uh, just battling with the, uh, the good people in the, around the country. And one thing that you become known for throughout your career at Michigan was big plays in key moments. And we remember the, the moment that closed the show against Ohio State as you guys capped off your third consecutive win. It was the Rod Moore interception, but your pass rush in that moment, what you did to pressure the QB was a big part of that as well. And scouts are going to see that on film. Take me back to that moment. Break that play down for me. I played there. So we had like a little stunt. Uh, so both ends crashed, me and Braden both crashed. And uh, the D tackles was wrapping around for contain. So kind of took a couple steps up the field, uh, sold it inside, and then kind of just, you know, he had to get out of the way. So I had to run him over. Then uh, he kind of held me a little bit. So I was falling down. And then I was trying to do my best to affect the throw. I feel like I did. And you guys, especially your recruiting class coming in, you know, you've been a group that's now been able to three years in a row take down the Buckeyes and you cap it off with that national title. The, the expectations that you had individually coming in, I remember reading a bit about a recruiting visit that you took the last time Ohio State had defeated Michigan and just the feeling you had in that moment, seeing the Buckeyes leaving the field victorious. And it seemed like you were a little bit kind of convicted in that moment, thinking you could be a part of what would come in and change things. So take me back to that moment, what that mentality really kind of developed in you. Right, so, you know, coming back, you know, uh, what was it, 2019 when I came to the Ohio State game, I was playing in the big house, you know, seeing us. Well, obviously, we lost or whatnot, but I could just feel the culture. I could just feel like there was more to be done here at Michigan. I feel like our 2020 recruiting class could, you know, be, be a part of something special. And I feel like we, we did that. And the NFL process right now as it plays out here, I'm curious because you have gotten to get interviewed by a variety of teams. You've gone through workouts multiple times at this point. What are some of the things you're hearing about scouts? What sense are you getting for how they're viewing you right now? Oh, uh, you know, uh, the teams like me. Uh, I feel like everyone likes you, but do they love you? You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So kind of just got to get a gauge. But right now, I feel like, you know, everyone, everyone likes you of some sort, but you got to, you know, navigate your way and find the teams that really love you. And as you go through this process, a lot of times teams are not only breaking down the film itself for you as a football player, but trying to get a sense for how your career ended up developing. And one thing you went through as a defender, you had three different defensive coordinators throughout your time in Ann Arbor as well, playing with the Wolverines. Is that the type of thing that you think can be become a positive for you as you transition to the NFL? Uh, most definitely, you know, uh, you know, start out with Coach Brown, then we uh, transitioned to Coach Mac Mike McDonald, <laughs> excuse me, and then Coach Mentor. Uh, you know, those last two coordinators I had, they were a very big uh, pro scheme. So I feel like, you know, playing in those, uh, the, the similar schemes, uh, really the same scheme, uh, is really preparing me for the next level. I was reading a bit about just the the impact that your mom has had on your athletic journey, how, how you know, sort of effervescent she is as a sports fan, how energetic she is about a variety of things. Give me a description of your mother. And in what ways has your mom ended up impacting your football journey? You know, my mom, uh, she's my everything. You know what I'm saying? She's very passionate in football as well. It's kind of funny. She always watches NFL Network or... I was watching some about <laughs> sports. Like every time I come home, she got something on the TV. You know what I'm saying she's just very energetic. She loved the game as well, and she's just been such you know uh, integral part of my life. And you know, I just want to do everything I can to repay her. And your dad, of course, played professional football, had a pretty lengthy career in the NFL. Right. Does the knowledge that you've gained from that and from his journey does that even add and enhance the confidence you have in going through this process? Uh, definitely, you know, uh, always get the couple pointers from mom and my dad. Like you said, my, my dad went through his process uh, a long time ago, but you know what I'm saying? He's got some knowledge. He's been around the game a lot. So, you know, I always like to, you know, keep my ears open. As you helped lead the Michigan Wolverines to a national championship, you know, the Alabama victory was one thing, but there was a Tampa connection that the nation got a glimpse of as well that I think kind of gave people a unique look into your personality, your character after the game, kind of a stolen moment where 
Michael Penix, after you guys had battered him around throughout the game with that exceptional pass rush you guys had coming from Ann Arbor, you made sure you, you chased him up the tunnel essentially as he was kind of leaving the field, holding his ribs, and he, he had his face uh, draped in towels. But you wanted to make sure that you took that moment to just kind of share some congratulatory sort of, you know, I exchanges with him after the game. I know you're both from Tampa, but what went into that decision for you to do that? You know what I'm saying? Uh, we both from the same city. Uh, he had a hell of a year, uh, Heisman, Heisman caliber year, you know what I'm saying? It was, it was just best to go, go pay my homage, you know what I'm saying? Just, you know, so, like, tell him, you know, it's going to be all right. Keep your head up. Uh, you know, just keep putting on and uh, keep doing you, buddy. When you were growing up as a kid, I mean, all of us as athletes, I know you played hoops and other sports as well as you were growing up. I think baseball also. But, you know, as football became your journey, and I, I would imagine there was probably an NFL team in particular that you were most passionate about growing up. Who was your favorite NFL team? I go with the Tampa Bay Bucks. Okay. Uh, you know, we had a lot of a lot of down years, but <laughs> you know, when we had Brady, Brady come to the city, uh, we were able to put it together, so bring home a Super Bowl, so... Definitely the Bucks. There's been a lot of up and down uh, with them, but you know what I'm saying? Definitely grew up a Bucks fan. Okay, so you were, even in those down years, before Tom Brady showed up and they weren't winning, you were actually was, willing to stick with Tampa and be a Bucks fan during that yeah. time? Yeah, I was with them. Josh Freeman, you know, you, you name them, I was with them. They were bad and a good. I can definitely respect that. And the, the draft weekend itself, as it approaches here, really around the corner, just days away right now, where do you plan to take it all in at? How are you actually going to view the draft? Where will you be? Uh, I'm probably going to be uh, around the Tampa area or so. Probably get a little little Airbnb or something like that. You know, uh, my close family, uh, close friends and whatnot. No, just, you know, be together together as a family and friends and just take it all in, like you said. And give me a sense for what you think it'll feel like when you do hear your name called draft weekend, as much buildup as there's been to this point, once you actually hear your name called. I feel like it'd be like a big sign of relief. Well, it's been a long, lengthy process these past few months, and, you know, just hear my name called, it just feel like, you know, a little sign of relief. But I know it's just only the beginning, and it's just going to be time to get to work as soon as I get my name called. So it's going to be fun in a moment, but I know, like, you know, right after that, I got to get ready for mini camp and whatnot, so... So it's going to be over pretty quick. Yes, it's certainly a quick turnaround. There's no doubt about that. But before I let you run, Jalen, just you and some of the other Michigan teammates, I mean, there's a potential for some historic numbers being put up for how many of you guys end up getting drafted. Is that part of the conversation right now for everything you and a lot of your fellow Wolverines have accomplished up to this point? Are you sort of hoping that a lot of names get called and you sort of etch yourselves in history together that way? Oh, definitely. You know, I hope all my brothers get drafted. You know what I'm saying? And That'd be great, you know, breaking the record for, for the most most guys dropped from the school, like I said. So, I'm saying I'm, I'm hoping the best for all my brothers, all my teammates. So, I'm looking forward to it. Jalen Harrell, all Big Ten, both on the field and in the classroom. Really appreciate you taking the time. Best of luck. Yes, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. As the Big Impact team is committed to creating lasting change in local communities, the team is partnered with a local Chicago public school Brunson Math and Science Specialty School is to go in and have some of the folks from the Student Athlete uh, Coalition to come together and spend some time with middle schoolers. They got a chance to ask some current and future Big Ten athletes questions about their path of working towards Big Ten institutions and what it would be like to be a student athlete in this conference. It's a great effort made by the conference there. And uh, effort made here by Rob Rang of Fox Sports to uh, put his NFL draft analysis together, ranking some of the NFL draft prospects coming out of the Big Ten Conference here specifically is what we have on the screen. Of course, no surprise there, USC quarterback Caleb Williams listed in the number one spot. Another in the top five there is Marvin Harrison Jr. And the dog QB, Michael Penix Jr., former Indiana Hoosier, is just outside the top ten as the number 11 prospect. Jake and I were able to start talking a little bit of NFL draft earlier in the week. So Jake Butt uh, back with me right now. And there are a few names we wanted to get to earlier in the week. We didn't get to then. Now we get the opportunity on a Friday mm -hmm. to get back into some of those guys. Let's go with the, the name that is constantly on the tip of everyone's tongue for a variety of reasons. At quarterback, Caleb Williams. He is a unique prospect, a, a very titillating subject for a lot of folks uh, for various reasons. How do you see him as an NFL draft prospect? I mean, 
generational talent. I know that word gets used. Maybe it's thrown around a little too much. Maybe these a little days, bit. But turn on the tape, and he's special. Um, there we go. Uh, turn on the tape, and you look at Caleb Williams. He's special, man. He's a generational talent. Uh, you know, what makes – I'll use Pat Mahomes as an example. You have a great play caller in Andy Reid. So whatever Andy Reid can think about, whatever mm-hmm. play he dreams up, He's got a quarterback that can make that throw. Mm -hmm. That's Caleb Williams going to the Bears. Uh, But what I like about, I think, fit and having a plan and organizational alignment is key to a quarterback's success. The Bears, historically, in recent history, have not done that with their quarterbacks. I believe they've done that right now. Mm -hmm. So you got DJ Moore and you got Keenan Allen. That's a great one-two punch. You've got a great tight end room, Cole Komet and Gerald Everett. You've added pieces to the offensive line. You get a top five uh, running back in DeAndre Swift. There's pieces in place where you can say, even though you're drafting number one overall, that he's not walking in to immediately have to put the entire weight of the success of the team on his shoulders. And they got assets. That number nine pick, what they do with it, they they have a bunch of options and could trade back. They're setting him up for success. I don't buy into all the off-field stuff, too. Who among us would pass the test when you're judged in every area of your life under a microscope? Uh This kid's 20, 21 years old. He's made 10 million bucks. We're nitpicking. He's never been a distraction at USC. So I I think that he has all the intangibles to go out there and have a phenomenal NFL career. Now, when you are the number one pick in the draft and you're you're viewed in that vein, yes, the scrutiny will be that much more. And we've been able to watch Michael Penix Jr. very closely from his time in Indiana and then meeting up with the Michigan Wolverines Mm -hmm. in the national championship game. He's a lefty. He's got a big arm. And he was able to stay healthy in his time in Seattle, which was fun to watch after seeing the way so many seasons in Bloomington came to an end a little bit early. How do you see Michael Penix's NFL prospects? I'm almost shocked that he's – the consensus is Caleb and Drake May, uh, uh, Jaden down there in LSU, yeah, and J.J. Jay McCarthy. Yeah. And it's like, why – what? Michael Penix was in that Heisman conversation. Mm-hmm. I mean, seriously, you know, what we talked about and what we saw all year – Pocket presence, accuracy, ball placement. Uh, When you want to know about a prospect, go turn on the biggest games. He played Oregon twice. Both those games, he hit key big-time throws in the fourth quarter late in the game. Uh, Texas, the dude put out some phenomenal tape, right? Uh, I understand the medical history, but... I've had three ACLs. I'm still walking. You know, they, they fix these things these days. Uh, yeah. And he ran a 4-5 at his, at his pro day and jumped 36 and, a half inch, uh, 36 and a half inches. You know, when it comes to some of these other products like Drake May, Caleb, uh, Jaden Daniels, you know, part of their highlights are doing things outside of the pocket and making like these, these Johnny Manziel type college plays. That, that doesn't work as much in the NFL. You have to be a pocket passer. Penix made 88% of his throws from the pocket last year. Number one in college football. He is very comfortable operating within the scheme and the system. And on the other end, with the injuries, I like a guy that has walked through the storm and overcome it. Mm -hmm. At the Heisman ceremony, talking about how he was crying to himself in his dorm rooms, wondering if it was over. He'll never take a day for granted. So I like Michael Penix. He's in Talk about fit. He'll be picked later than these guys. He's going to be in a good situation. Yeah, it really should be. There's no doubt about that. Maybe the potential is a rookie quarterback, study behind a vet for a little bit, and then really get your game on when the opportunity presents itself. Uh, let's go over to the defensive side of the football. Player who's near and dear to my heart. I've been following Cooper DeGene since he was in high school. Such an impressive physical specimen. And I think on the whole, the, the way that we end up looking at him just as a prospect, I'm wondering whether or not you see him as a safety or a mm-hmm. corner because that is part of the conversation. Why not both? Uh, and maybe that adds to his value. Mm. I think there's some people that are telling on themselves when they say, I wonder if he's athletic enough to be a corner in the NFL. You didn't watch tape, if that's <laughs> the case. Runs a 4-4 at his pro day. Two weeks after being cleared, he jumped 38 and a half inches. He's a phenomenal athlete, an excellent uh, basketball player in, in, uh, in high school. And Kirk Ferentz has coached a lot of great players. Mm-hmm. He said Cooper was the best he's ever coached. Seriously, <laughs> think about that statement. Fit matters for him. So how about I, I want to just present this. The Colts have uh, pick number 15. They run 70% zone coverage, the highest in the NFL. What I love about Cooper is we talked about the athleticism. It's the instincts. You see that on special teams. You see it when he comes down and makes an interception and then takes it back to the house. 
if he can go to the right system, I love him in a zone-based uh, system where he can have his eyes on the quarterback and use those instincts. Uh, you know, and the fact it's a limited roster in the NFL, he can play corner, nickel, or safety and return kicks for you. He is an extremely, will be an extremely uh, valuable piece for whatever team gets him. A movable chess piece who can make plays all over the field. There's no doubt about that. Also, Everyone likes to get promoted, right? We've seen a few examples of that in the Big Ten Conference just coming off of last season. And we'll address that here from a spring football perspective, especially Sharon Moore in a position right now, showed himself as one of the top assistant coaches and coordinators in the entire country, had the audition with the big whistle for a few games as well, handled it so well. Mm -hmm. How do you view the task at hand right now for Sharon Moore in leading Michigan? Well, I, I think... We know who, what his identity is going to be, run the ball and play defense, and they have the pieces to do that. The key is who's going to play quarterback, and no one's quite separated. The other thing that I would look for is leadership. Mikey Sane was still, J.J. McCarthy, Blake Corum, uh, Mike Barrett, a couple guys. What, what made Michigan successful was leadership, and Jim, that was one of Jim Harbaugh's best attributes. I believe Sharon Moore will do the same. Got to figure out quarterback, got to figure out the leaders in the locker room. UCLA has an alum now who's leading their program. It was a little bit in more surprising fashion when Deshaun Voster took things over, as most folks didn't expect Chip Kelly to go take a coordinator role. Mm -hmm. So now he gets this opportunity to lead UCLA. What's his task look like? Well, it's everything moves so fast, right? Like that was a late, late move for Chip Kelly to leave, yeah. and now it's all had to come together. And yet I like the moves. Uh, their defensive coordinator, DeAnton Lynn, goes across town to USC. You hire from uh, within with Coach Malloy. And then I love the – the you, you go get Eric Bieniemy, a mm. phenomenal football mind that's coached some great talents. Combine that with the fact you're returning your quarterback, Ethan Garbers, and I say there's pieces in place. But as is true for everyone, the competition's elevated. That's going to be the challenge for UCLA. And with that being elevated, it seems like the energy around UCLA, that, that can really pay dividends, especially for the first year of a coach. And he is UCLA. He played there. He's been on the staff for a while. He's played in the NFL. I just, I do think that that's important in today's world. You know, when you're sell, selling to recruits, you got to come here. Well, he lived that and he's walked that walk and he's a vet invested in a line just like he wants the future of his program to be. And been such a great player throughout his collegiate career, throughout his NFL career. Really excited to see what that brings to the table for the Bruins. My thanks to everyone we had on the show. Jalen Harold, Pizzo, and Cappy, and of course my guy Jake Butt. I'm Anthony Heron. Thank you for tuning in to Big Ten today.